Around Chesapeake Bay, people say there's nothing prettier than a skipjack under sail. But the men on board the old wooden boats say there's nothing tougher. The skipjack crewmen do the same back-breaking labor as their fathers and grandfathers, raising and lowering the heavy steel dredges that scrape oysters from the bottom of the bay. They face the same hazards, the same bone-chilling winter weather, the same way of life. Skipjacks are the last commercial work boats in North America, powered by the wind. One by one, they are disappearing. But before they vanish from the bay, they will take on a new life somewhere else through the painstaking efforts of John Barber. Barber hopes to capture them forever in paint and canvas. To do it right, he gets to know the men as well as the boats. The personality of the skipper becomes a part of the boat. The stories that you hear about the drownings and the crew going overboard in the middle of February and never coming up again. There's something here that digs deep and goes deep into the soul. The first skipjacks were launched in the 1880s. By World War I, hundreds worked the bay. Dawn to dusk, skipjack men sailed the boats and worked the dredges at the same time. Dredges that had to be hauled in by hand-cranked winches. Demand for oysters was unlimited. Competition was fierce. There was piracy and fighting over oyster beds. Rifle shots were fired between boats. Police patrolled the waters with mounted machine guns. It was an all-out oyster war. These men are long gone, but a few of the boats they labored aboard still survive. The skipjack Rebecca Ruark has been working for a hundred years, oldest in the fleet. Built first as a schooner, she was partially rebuilt in the 1930s and again in the 60s. It's reckoned that only one quarter of her is the same boat that went on the water in 1886. Her current owner is Wade Murphy. He's been working for six weeks, doing the maintenance that keeps the ancient boat afloat. Well, I don't do much of my woodwork myself. I just do what I can get somebody else to do. Uh, I don't like to do the work because I ain't good at it. But sometimes you uh, have to do your own. I say I could do probably better dredging than I could caulking. But I, I think I got her. You got to have a little leak. Keep an eye on her. If you don't keep an eye on her, I will sink on you. You know what I'm saying? Wade bought the Rebecca from Emerson Todd, who sailed skipjacks for 65 years. Even a heart attack couldn't stop him. He had his crews help him on and off the boat. Finally, he decided to sell. Well, when I saw her, I felt so bad, I just had to cry over it. I, I stayed down long wharf when she left out, as long as I got there. Right. It hurt me, you know. I think about her all the time. The end of the day, well, I don't think about her. Yeah. He, uh, he messaged it. Uh, he called me the first month, at least once a week, and check on the old boat, asked how the old boat was doing, and uh, would emphasize to me that uh, he wasn't miss He didn't miss her. He was just wondering. I liked it, and still like it, and would like to do it right now if I was able. I, I couldn't do it. But the world Emerson left behind goes on. The new season begins unceremoniously in old boat yards, many crowded with gear almost as heavy and antiquated as the boats themselves. By October, the 30-odd skipjacks that do survive are eased into the water. But around the bay are reminders that every season a few more can't make it out. Boats that can't be maintained are reluctantly abandoned. 
but with some small hope that they might one day be reclaimed. The launch is far from glamorous, but a gala affair awaits them. On the last weekend of October before the dredging season, the captains share their boats with the public in a festive celebration. Visitors are rewarded with a closer glimpse of the oysterman's world. The skipjack community celebrates itself and boats that seem like members of the family. This is my daughter, Amanda Fleetwood, and she's six months old, and her great-great-grandfather owned this boat when it was originally built back in 1901. His name was Wells Evans, and he was the first owner of the skipjack, the Catherine. The skipjack Catherine is owned by Russell Dyes. My father uh, dredged on this boat, middle deck. He was a crew hand when he was uh, 16 years old. So uh, I bought the boat, uh, me and my partner bought this boat five years ago, and I've been dredging it, uh, catching orchards with it since. The captains do more than show off their boats. They square off for a skipjack race. The days when they exchanged gunfire are gone, but that fighting spirit remains. Give me some wind. Come on, give me some wind. Come on, fire down on me now. Now's what I need it right now. Get on. Yeah, we're on. Oh, I don't want to get inside. Do you want to? Be conscious. I'm going to die when I hit this boy. All right, let's do it, boys. Take the board down. The weekend of celebration quickly gives way to a different excitement, the serious business of a new oyster season. Heading into her hundredth season, Rebecca Ruark sets out under Wade Murphy's careful guidance. The men gather for breakfast. The rougher I feel, the harder I work. Don't tell me now. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. A work day that starts in darkness often ends in darkness. To prevent over harvesting, an 1865 Maryland law dictates that dredging for oysters be done under sail and only after sunrise. But to get to the oyster beds, skipjacks are allowed a peculiar form of motorized drive. It's called a pushboat, usually powered by an old auto engine. Once it is hauled free from the water, there is no doubt that the skipjack is working exclusively under sail. OK, boys, let them go. Dredges are dropped every few minutes. While they scrape along the bottom, there's no relief for the crew. Each haul is carefully sorted. Oysters under three inches must be returned. No more than 150 bushels can be taken each day. Violations mean stiff fines or even being shut down altogether. Skipjacks only take about 10% of the oyster yield. A few thousand hand and mechanical tongers account for the rest. But any way you do it, it's a lot of work for little money.
Wade Murphy's son goes oystering when he can, but he hasn't decided if he'll become the fourth generation of Murphy men to follow the water. His father hopes he won't. I'd rather see him get a job on land where he's more, uh, more steady money and steady work. It's, it's getting harder every year to make it. It's getting harder every year. It's nothing easy about it. And if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be doing it, but I love it. I, uh, I'd rather dredge and oyster, I'd rather dredge and crab. Well, I'd rather work on water than anything else. I love it. John Barber's commitment to skipjacks takes a different form. The first step in, in doing these paintings is to be there and to be on the water because there's too much incredible beauty right there in the bay. And I'd, I'd simply rather have the painting be born from those actual conditions in nature. The painting is born in an instant right there on the water when the cloud passes over and the, the sun smacks the freshly painted hull. And frozen, in my mind at that point, is an image that's really hard to forget. And I'll bring those back to the studio in my mind and in the sketches and photographs and assemble it here on the canvas. I feel very serious about my work. And that's why I'm trying to do it well. And that's why the response from these watermen means so much to me. If I can paint the scene to their satisfaction, and if it says to me what it needs to say from an aesthetic standpoint, I've reached my goal. If that day comes when the only skipjack we have left is in a museum, and there are none others on the bay, and there's a painting left by John Barber, I would hope that a descendant of a skipjack captain would walk up and say, look at that painting. And that's the way it was. Look at the skipper. He's, he's yelling at the crew. They're hauling in the dredge. The tricing lines are right. The jib hanks are right. Lazy jacks are set. I'd like for them to say, that's the way it was. That's the way it happened. And that's a reasonable, I think a very reasonable hope for me. These men and women and their boats and their lifestyle represents a portion of America's maritime heritage, which we will lose. I'm trying to paint what's happening there today so that it will be there for my children and yours.